we are going to uh, we are going to talk about uh, the whole the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, here we go. OK, so as you guys know, uh, in this second quarter of the uh, of the of uh, of the year, we are going to be in the book of John. And uh, I did send around a video with an introduction to uh, to the book of John. And so if you get a chance to look at that, uh, please do. It will give you an overview of the whole wonderful book of John the Apostle. John is the apostle who lived um, probably longer than all the other apostles. And uh, he wrote uh, five books of the Bible. He wrote John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And he also wrote the book of Revelation. And he probably wrote all of them in the AD 80s and 90s. And, uh, you know, he may have been the youngest of the apostles. There's some speculation about that. You can see more about that in my, uh, in my introduction video. And uh, today for our midweek, we are gonna look at John chapters 14 to 16, where he says a lot of things, but uh, many of those things are about the work of the Holy Spirit. And as Simon mentioned in his welcome, um, that is a very important thing to know about, um, though often uh, misunderstood. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, begin here with uh, a couple of remarks. First of all, um, you know, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, John 14 to 16, let us set the scene, okay? What's happening in these chapters? In these three chapters, Jesus is saying goodbye. They have just had the Passover meal on, uh, on Thursday night, the Thursday before Good Friday. And, um, you know, uh, Jesus has washed his disciples' feet, and now he's going to speak to them for a long time, giving them some teaching, and then he's going to say a prayer, and, um, you know, then he's going to be arrested. And um, this uh, section of the Bible, this section of the book of John, is called by scholars a farewell discourse, okay? It means like a a set of teachings and, you know, at, through these teachings, it's, it's like, here are my last words, my last teachings, remember these, um, especially for the disciples and he's saying goodbye. And, um, you know, the disciples, as, as they start to understand, you know, they, they, they didn't fully understand, but as, as it started to dawn on them that he was not gonna be with them much longer, they're very sad, but Jesus said, it is better for you that I'm going away. In John 14 and verse 15, we read these words. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, he says here that, uh, uh, he, you know, the spirit is going to be another advocate. An advocate is a defender uh, like a lawyer. And when he says another advocate, why is he saying another advocate? Because up until this point, Jesus had been their advocate. He'd been their helper. He'd been their defender. Um, he had been their comforter. So uh, this word advocate can also mean helper, comforter, defender. And he had been protecting them. After this section of teaching, he uh, lifts up his eyes to heaven and he prays. And one of the things he says in his prayer in John 17, 12 is, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. And of course, who's he talking about there? He's talking about, uh, he's talking about Judas, okay? And uh, so what, what does, now he's, so, he's, so he's saying, I was the advocate and I'm going, and now I'm not leaving you as orphans, he says. Okay, remember, 
He says here, I will not leave you as orphans. So that's super, super comforting. And um, he's saying, you know, I will come to you. So he's telling them, you know what? Don't worry, because even though I'm going in body, uh, actually, I'm still going to be with you. And um, it's going to be very, very real. I'll be right there with you. And so, but what does he mean by that? He means that that would happen through the spirit, through the, this new advocate who was going to be coming. So what does this advocate do? Well, firstly, he is a helper. As we've just read, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. So isn't that encouraging? The Holy Spirit, the very spirit of the living God, the God who created the most distant stars and the burning sun, the God who made the very air that we are breathing right now the God who gave us life and breath and everything else, the God who made frogs and chipmunks and monkeys and water and mountains and bananas, that powerful, beautiful, creative, loving, awesome God in the Holy Spirit is gonna be a helper to us forever. And if you're a Christian, you know, that ought to be the most awesome, wonderful source of comfort and encouragement that, that, that you could ever hear. Um, and how do we know this? We know this by faith. Um, we, we see and know and trust God's word because he's proven himself reliable. But by faith, you know, God wants us to remind ourselves on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, that at every second of every day, um, that helper, the Holy Spirit, is, is right with you. You know, I know uh, it's a tough time for, for many of us. Um, uh, you know, Uman, Uman is here because I was having a chat with him right before the message, uh, right before the midweek. And I, I was having a chat with him because Uman lost his mother-in-law unexpectedly. Um, his wife, Pam's mom, passed um, in the last few weeks. And I know that's been true of so many of us, you know, three, three of the men that I'm reaching out to or studying the Bible with uh, all lost their dads in recent weeks. And um, I know others of us have had, you know, recent uh, bad news about just our, our family's health. And um, uh, others of us, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, have lost people. It, it, it's, it's a tough, tough thing. But in all of that, I want you to know that as a Christian, um, the reality of God's spirit is, is, is 100%. And uh, when we pray, we are praying to a real God. And uh, when he gives us that peace, that strength, that comfort, that's not your imagination. Um, it's really real. Um, because, uh, because he is, he is, he is um, the spirit of God that was promised by Jesus Christ, who is 100% reliable. You know, how does the spirit help us? Well, later on in the New Testament, um, more is taught on this subject. The spirit helps us in prayer. In Romans 8, 26, it is written in the same way. The spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for. Okay, can I get a big amen to that? We don't know what we ought to pray for. How many of you have ever felt that? We don't know what we ought to pray for. Even the apostle Paul felt that. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes with us through wordless groans. That means, you know, even as we're praying, the spirit within us is joining us in prayer and he's telling the father and the son, um, you know, with expressions that go beyond words, exactly what you and I need. Isn't that so encouraging? Verse 27, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. You know, when we become Christians, we're brought into an amazing relationship. And it is the relationship between the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. 
and we get to share in that relationship. Um, isn't that amazing? You know, when, when we pray, um, we are participants and we join in in a conversation that has been going on since before the creation of this world. And that is the holy communication that exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now you and I are privileged to be a part of that conversation and even to add to that conversation with our prayers because we are his children. In Romans 8, 13, we also read about how the spirit helps us in another way. He, you know, there he says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So what's he saying there? You know, if you live according to the flesh, that means if you give in to your sinful appetites and desires, you will die, he says. You know, you can't, you can't live in anger and live. You can't live in lust and live. You can't live, you know, in greed and live. You can't live in sin and stay alive. But he says, you know, by the spirit, we can put to death the misdeeds of the body. And only by the spirit, only with the help of the spirit of God, can we begin to turn around that ancient rebellion, which was started by our first parents, Adam and Eve, which unleashed sin and death into the world. It doesn't matter if you're from Africa. It doesn't matter if you're from Asia. It doesn't matter if you're from Europe. It doesn't matter if you're from Polynesia, Melanesia, North America, or the Antarctic. It doesn't matter. Our first parents were Adam and Eve, and we are all the same. We don't know how to overcome our sinful desires. We are powerless, helpless, and in weakness until God does an operation in our hearts. The Bible calls that operation the circumcision of the heart. And it happens when we repent and are baptized. And at that point, God gives us his Holy Spirit. And that spirit helps us to put sin to death. I've shared this story before, but I remember once when I was a, um, probably a teenager, um, maybe in my late teens, and there was a period in my life where I wasn't happy. I began to experience the negative consequences of a lot of sin in my life. And in my heart, there was one particular day where I don't know why, but I kind of, you know, felt in my heart, my life is spiraling and just going in the wrong direction. I am headed the wrong way. And I remember because of my former religion, um, what I thought I would do is I would sit down for a while and I would meditate. That's what we did in my former religion rather than pray. And so I, I meditated, I tried to do like the practice of meditation. And the purpose was, I was trying to get a grip on myself, you know? Um, I couldn't say it in these words, but I was trying to get a grip on just the roaring sinful desires that were in my life. And the, the you know, I'll never forget that day because I started with, with the sincere desire to overcome and get under control um, my life. But within, I don't know, hours, I, I found myself involved in gross sin, the very sins that I was trying to overcome. And, you know, but that memory stayed with me because that was one of the things which convinced me, man, I have no power. I have no power. Without, without God in my life, without Jesus in my life, without the spirit in my life, there's no way that I'm going to be able to live in a pure and pleasing way to God, which makes me truly happy. And, um, and so, hey, isn't it great that the spirit is our helper? He helps us to pray, to do God's will, to put sin to death. He helps us to persevere. Listen, today, let's specifically ask God to help us in these areas. Are you weary? Is lockdown number three driving you bonkers? Listen, when we're weary, it's an opportunity for God to work powerfully. In Philippians 2 verse 12, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, 
continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. These two verses tell us a secret. Are you ready for the secrets? You know, these two verses tells us that there's a part that we pray, pay, play, there's a part that we play, and there's a part that God, through his spirit, plays in, um, in, in helping us to do the will of God. Our part is to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why fear? Well, we should fear God, okay? We should respect and be in awe of God, and we should take his words seriously. Um, why trembling? Because, you know, if we don't pay attention, if we don't stay alert, sin has a way of creeping up on us through the back door like a thief and, and overwhelming us. And so we should tremble in the sense that we need to, you know, always be at top alertness for the devil and for sin. But, you know, and, and so we should be thinking about, you know, hey, how do I, in all seriousness, put God's word into practice? And when we do that, you know what we find? What we find is power. We find the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because part two of this um, secret is God works in you. We will find God working in us to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And one of the most joyful things, one of the most pleasing things is that as the days and weeks and years go by of our walk with God, we find ourselves habitually thinking like God, pray, you know, um, speaking like Jesus, um, wanting the things which God wants, no longer wanting the things that we used to want. Um, and as you see those changes happening in your heart, that is because you've been working out your salvation with fear and trembling, and God has been working in you, yes, you, to will and to act according to his good purpose. Secondly, the spirit is not just helper. He's also an interpreter. He's an interpreter. In John 14, 25, it says, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So this teaching is not just in the New Testament, it's also in the Old Testament. In, uh, for example, uh, in your quiet time, read Psalm 25. You would love Psalm 25. You even know Psalm 25. You may not know that you know Psalm 25, but you know Psalm 25 because it is the basis of a song that we sing. And that song is, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul? And in that song, we sing, do we not? Teach me your ways um, and show me your paths. And, um, you know, in Psalm 25 and Psalm 119 and in other places, um, uh, the Bible teaches us in Old and New Testaments that God wants to be our tutor, our personal instructor, our teacher. And here, geez, you know, but in the Old Testament, not everybody had the Holy Spirit. Um, Jesus had to die for the Spirit to become available to everyone. And so now we have a privilege that our brothers and sisters from the Old Testament didn't have. And that privilege is God is with us at all times, waiting to interpret the truths of the Bible. So when, when it says, when I say he's our teacher, he, the Holy Spirit is not going to teach you something that is against the Bible because, uh, by the way, he wrote the Bible. So he's an interpreter. OK, as we study the word, we should be praying, Lord, you know, through the spirit, teach me to understand these words. Let it become real to me and help me to put it into practice. Put it into practice is a big one in James chapter one and verse five. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Awesome. Great promise. Ask God for wisdom and he will give it to you. But James 1 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So, you know, to get wisdom, 
we must not just listen to the word, nor even just read the word, but we must do what it says. Really believe that God will give you wisdom if you do his will. God will teach you personally. Listen, you can be a very wise person. In Psalm 119 and verse 99, it says, I have more insights than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders. Amen. For I obey your precepts. You can be a very wise person, but you need to ask God for wisdom. And then you need to be ready to do what the Bible says. Wisdom does not belong to the intelligent. Wisdom belongs to the obedient. Always remember that. Point number three, witness. The third way in which the Holy Spirit helps us, the way that he is an advocate, is that he is a witness. John 15, 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So he's saying here that what the Holy Spirit is going to do is to witness to the world. The Holy Spirit's role is to witness to the world that the word about Jesus Christ, what we call the gospel, is true. Okay, he, he is going to make Jesus known. He is going to bring home the truths that the Bible teaches about the Bible, about Jesus. He is going to glorify Jesus or big up Jesus. Um, and that's his role. Now, you know, in the next breath, Jesus told the apostles, you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. Um, my good friend, Pear, or par, I never know, some of us call him pair and some of us call him par. All I know is he's my good friend. And, uh, you know, he likes to say that the spirit needs a body. That's what he told me today, in fact, you know, the spirit needs a body. And maybe that's what Jesus was telling the apostles. Hey, the spirit's going to testify. But listen, you need to, you know, uh, a part of that job is, He's going to be working through you, by the way. So you need to be ready to tell people about me. And, you know, that's true today as well. Um, uh, the spirit uh, 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 works as we work, as we push ourselves and, you know, share about Jesus. The spirit gives us words and gives us strength and gives us insight. Okay. So we have an important part to play. Uh there's, there's another thing that the Spirit testifies to. He, he testifies about Jesus, but there's another thing that he testifies about. In Romans 8, 16, it says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So what is this testimony that the Spirit is giving? To whom is he giving this spirit, this testimony? You know, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe a part of that is to the unseen realm, to the realm of angels and demons and spiritual beings. Um, the spirit, um, because he is in us and with us, you know, he thus shows them that we are God's children. Okay, because his mark is on us, because he is there with us, you know, um, one scripture says, like a deposit guaranteeing the inheritance. Um, you know, uh, he also testifies, he, he tells the world and he tells the unseen world that we are God's children. And from within us, okay, so, but also there's also something going on inside because Galatians 4 is telling us, you know, that deep cry that you have in your heart, when you pray to your father in heaven, that intimacy, that deep cry, that longing, that desire, that, oh, father, you know, Lord, father, help me, you know, father, I love you, father, thank you, that deep heartfelt 
cry and prayer. What the Bible is telling us is even the fact that you know that and feel that is because the spirit is in you, um, you know, speaking along with you. All right. Now, sometimes we may say this, I don't share my faith because I don't know how to answer their questions. Okay, listen, I'm not gonna look at all of you, but you can put up your hands or in your, in your mind, you can put up your hand. If you ever made that excuse, I don't share my faith because I don't know how to answer their questions, okay? I don't think I can share my faith because what if they ask me something I don't know? If you ever thought that, okay, please tell me I'm not the only person who ever thought that. Yes, some of you did as well. All right, listen, I got news for you. The spirit is there to witness about Jesus in Acts 6. And, and that is to our advantage, okay? In act, that's to our advantage in our evangelism, I'm saying here. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the spirit gave him as he spoke, all right? Now, particularly under persecution, there is the promise that, uh, that the spirit will, will, you know, will help us to know what to say, but, um, you know, persecution is also, you know, the, 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 the persecution is also brought about by the pressure of evangelism, you know, people opposing or even asking questions. And so we need to be just so confident that 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 God will help us to know what to say. Now, I'm not saying that, um, you know, God may suddenly uh, give you some insights that you could not possibly have known before. I mean, God could do that. But what I am saying is God will give you the confidence and, and he will give you an answer when you thought you would be too afraid to give an answer, okay? Now, maybe that answer is just gonna be that you will confidently tell somebody, listen, I don't know the answer to your question, but, I, but you know what? I know someone who can answer that question. Ua Bazwaye can answer that question. Let me introduce you to him, you know? Um, and, uh, and so maybe that's what God will give you at that time. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit will give you that confidence, that peace, and an answer, okay, to say. And uh, so never let it be a reason um, or an excuse, um, you know, to not evangelize um, that you think, uh, oh, I, I wouldn't know how to answer people's questions. Because, you know, you don't have to know how to answer every question to tell people um, hey, listen, I know what Jesus has done in my life, and I just really like to invite you to church. Amen. All right, next, he is um, a helper, he is an interpreter, he is a witness, but he's also a prosecutor. What does that mean? John 16. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So what he's saying here is the advocate, okay, he's your defense advocate. He's your defense lawyer. But sometimes he turns into prosecutor. He proves the world to be in the wrong. About what? About sin, about righteousness, about judgment. What does he mean about sin? Because people don't believe in him. Listen, if, you, if people believe in Jesus, um, you know, he frees us from our sin. But if people don't believe in Jesus and don't, don't follow him, um, then we're guilty of sin. We're proven to be in the wrong. Okay, that's what he means. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, okay, where you can see me no longer. You know, when Jesus was on this earth, he testified about righteousness. He was the example of righteousness. Um, you know, he was the upward call, the setter of the standard. 
But now he says, I'm going to the father where you can see me no longer. So the spirit is taking his place um, to convict the world. You know, the spirit does that work of convicting our consciences um, and, and, and showing us, no, what you're doing is not righteous, okay? And then he says, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Listen, what he's saying is that the ruler of this world, Satan, okay, now stands condemned. And since the ruler has been judged, his followers, his followers also stand under judgment, okay? Uh, in going to the cross, Jesus defeated Satan, you know, once and for all. And, uh, and so, uh, so part of the Spirit's work is also making that clear in, in, in the gospel message. In Acts 24, 24, we find a very, very interesting account. Listen to this. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus, as Paul talked about what? Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Okay, I guess, I guess he got super convicted in our language. You know, do these words remind you of something? Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. Okay, remember, the spirit will convict, will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Okay, sin, self-control, that sounds pretty close. And then righteousness and judgment. So, in other words, Paul's message was the very message that Jesus said the spirit was sent um, in his role as prosecutor, okay? And so uh, it tells you something about, well, you know, and we do this, don't we? We do this. Yes, we do. When we study the Bible with people, what do we study? We study sin. We study repentance, you know? Uh, we study salvation. We study about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. And uh, sometimes people are afraid and they say, that's enough for now. And at other times they repent and they are baptized. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 14, 24, um, here's another interesting angle on this point. But if an unbeliever or inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming God is really among you. What is this about? This is, Paul is describing a church service and he says, you know, prophesying, he's referring to a miraculous gift of prophecy, but the word prophesying also means to declare God's word. So what he's saying is, you know, when a visitor comes, a friend comes along and maybe they come to a Bible discussion and everybody is just so full of joy and conviction. And, you know, he hears the insights, he hears the comments, he hears the personal sharing. And what happens? He or she gets so convicted. They're like, wow, you know, this is really speaking to me. And, um, and or they come to a church service. They hear the communion. They hear the sermon. They hear the songs. You know, they, so they have a conversation in the fellowship. And they walk away thinking, wow, you know, could God be speaking to me? You know, um, that's what he's talking about is, is there the spirit is working through Christians in that role of convicting people for their good. So, you know, what should we do? We should pray for people's hearts to change. Okay, pray for people's hearts to change. The, maybe the greatest example in the New Testament is in the story of the Apostle Paul, Acts 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that uh, if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now listen, what kind of story is this? At the start of the story, this man is breathing out murderous threats. And, you know, his goal in going to Damascus is that he might take disciples as prisoners. That's the beginning of the story. A mere three verses later, 
the Lord of the people who he's persecuting. You know, he's speaking to Jesus and he's saying, who are you? And what does he call him? Lord. Here he's like persecuting Jesus and the church. And here he's calling him Lord. How can this possibly be? I'll tell you what, it's the power of God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, I have a feeling a lot of Christians were praying um, because of the persecution brought about by Saul, who became Paul. And I, I have a feeling a lot of Christians were praying for him. We should always pray for people's hearts to change. You know, I've, I remember some years ago in Brunel University, there was one particular guy who was studying the Bible and in his head, he knew what he needed to change. In his heart, he didn't see it or feel it or have conviction. And, uh, you know, one afternoon, myself and Helen and Zach and Rebecca all prayed for this guy. And then Zach and I went to study with him. It was amazing. You know, it just, the only way I can explain it is God had worked. We didn't change the words we said. We brought up the same things that we had brought up before. But all of a sudden, his attitude was 100% turned around. Um, and he wanted to repent. Um, one of the issues was he needed to break up with his, his girlfriend. They were in an immoral relationship. And um, you know what? Not long after that, he was baptized. And not long after that, the girlfriend was baptized. And both of them are faithful uh, to today. So uh, how about that? Finally, the Holy Spirit is a revealer. This point is very close to the point of him being an interpreter. In John 16, 12, Jesus said, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So some of this is the same as interpreter because he's saying, you know, he's going to receive from me. He's going to make it known to you. Um, he's going to guide you into all the truth. Okay. That's a lot. A lot of that is that teaching role. But the slight difference is, um, is this bit. He will tell you what is yet to come. So one of the promises that Jesus gave the apostles was the spirit is going to tell you about future events. So, you know, um, indeed, this same John wrote the book of Revelation and he knew nothing about that at the time when Jesus was on earth speaking to him. And, um, you know, we have the book of Revelation with us. We also have um, 1 Thessalonians 5 and um, 2 Peter 2 and 2 Thessalonians 3 and 1 Corinthians 15 and, um, you know, Matthew 24 and other, other, other passages in, in, the, in the New Testament that tell us about where the Spirit is telling us, is giving us some clues and some hints about the future coming of, of, of Jesus. And um, um, obviously one of the things he tells us is nobody knows the day or the hour, but, uh, but, but there are, um, that, that is a great study. And in the last quarter of the year, we actually are gonna be studying the book of Revelation together. So that's gonna be fun. All right, uh, he is a revealer. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, 11, speaking about this aspect of the Holy Spirit's work for us and in us, Paul says in verse 11, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. For what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. So we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. Um, you know, what, is, what does all this mean? What this means is that, um, you know, it, we need the Holy Spirit to understand spiritual realities, okay? And um, so just, just understand that. And, and as you think about your studies, your friends, your loved ones, just pray so much that the Spirit will get through to them, that God would work on their hearts. You know, what, what, he, what he's also saying is you have to be a spiritual person to understand spiritual truth. So basically, you have to genuinely be a humble, obedient person if you want to understand the Spirit's truth. And um, 
So pray, pray for people to, for God to convict them so they'll become that way. The spirit, Jesus said, would reveal what is yet to come. Also talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen, you know, here's an example. Here's an example of, of, of Paul telling, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself in the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. This is about Jesus's return and our transformation. And, uh, but the spirit showed this to Paul. He revealed what is yet to come. 1 Thessalonians 4, I mentioned this to you uh, earlier on. Here's another passage, you know, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Loud command, voice of the archangel. We who are still alive will be caught up in the air and we will be with the Lord forever. It's an example of the spirit revealing. So what have we learned today? The Holy Spirit, he is helper. Okay, he helps us in our prayers. He helps us put sin to death. He helps us persevere. He helps us do God's will. Ask for God's help today, brothers, sisters, friends, even you who are studying the Bible. He is interpreter. Does the Bible seem so difficult to understand? Yeah, some parts of it are. Ask God to help you because his promise is, hey, listen, he can make you wiser than the elders. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a witness. He, he's he's going to tell the world about Jesus. He's going to make the truth of the gospel um, real to people. He also testifies to the fact that we are God's children. Um, and even, even, even the fact that we want to pray, we want to be pure, we want to cry out, Abba, Father, that comes from the Spirit's presence in our lives. He's prosecutor. He's the one who convicts people of guilt with regard to sin and righteousness and the judgment to come. And um, so, you know, we need to pray when we study with people, when we reach out to them, that he will do that in their lives. And finally, he's the revealer. He tells us what's in his word, um, but, he, but he also has shown us, mostly through the word, through the apostles, um, some clues about what is yet to come. And that also is part of his, his work. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Hope this has been very encouraging to you. Let me hand over to my fellow elder, uh, Ua. Ua, all these guys are gonna now become wiser than us, but that's okay. Uh, please, can you do the clothes? Thank you. <laughs>